So tonight it's my great uh, pleasure to introduce you to Tess Taylor. Uh, she, Tess um, is, uh, uh, her poetry and nonfiction have appeared in The Atlantic, Boston Review, Harvard Review, Literary Imagination, The Times Literary Supplement, and The New Yorker. Uh, you probably have heard her uh, review poetry for NPR's All Things Considered, where she regularly does that. She is now currently the Assistant Professor of English and Creative Writing at Whittier College. Please join me in welcoming Tessa. Um, so thank you, Jim. It is so wonderful to be here. And um, I, I was here, you know, nine years ago uh, when I was just in the very beginning of, of making this book what would become this book. And I didn't even know the form that this book was going to take. I'll talk about that in a little bit. But it's, it's really remarkable to walk in here and um, smell the smell of the archive, you know, and look up and see Isaiah Thomas's um, letterpress up there. And just remember the feeling of being here as a young um, graduate student. I had just finished my MFA program at Boston University drove out here kind of just minutes after graduating and um, kind of took up residence. And uh, I was beginning to try to think about how to work on a new kind of poem, a sort of a, a historical poem. And I didn't really know yet what that would be or how to find models for it or even how to research it. And the fact that this place was going to allow me to in this, enter into this wild exploration was pretty remarkable. Um, I was here with people who became friends who were sort of full, full-blooded historians, and um, and struck up friendships with them. And everybody who comes here um, is really in awe of the objects that come up um, from behind these doors. And the librarians are so generous to you, to any of us, as we ask questions and ask for more things. And. Um, I mean, I've gone on and worked in lots of other archives, but this was a, a really unique place in that in allowing you to be in contact, really close contact with really um, old remnants. Uh, and in fact, um, the poems that I wrote ended up being about remnants. I don't know if I can make that stay on, but I just wanted to show you this cover because I'm going to talk about it in just a second, um, just a little bit what became the cover of my book. So the story behind my book uh, sort of began in 1997. Um, that was the year that Eugene Foster ran a DNA test um, using a new method that was then new, um, that where he was able to match pieces of the Y chromosome on male Jefferson descendants to pieces of the Y chromosome on male descendants of Sally Hemings, and, be able, and was able to piece together that they all shared a chromosomal match with Jefferson's uncle, um, who was kind of the, 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 the branch, that they, and it was kind of a, an arcane form of, of DNA testing. We've gotten much more sophisticated since then. Um, but anyway, this was, this was a, the piece of evidence that led historians to have that enormous kind of public discussion about the fact that Jefferson had very likely fathered children with Sally Hemings. Uh, this was relevant to me because I'm a white Jefferson descendant, and I had grown up um, miles away from Virginia, but with Virginia family, and, um, and I didn't know uh, what to make of this information right away. And uh, it, was, it was sort of a shock to me. Um, not because, at the time, a lot of, there was a lot of discussion of whether it was true or not true, um, whether this DNA evidence was good enough. But it was such a big public splash, and those of you that were around at the time will remember what a splash it was. It was just in the news all, all the you know, constantly. Um, what, what it provoked in me was a kind of a reckoning with the fact that although I knew a great deal about my own family tree, and I knew about this, this fact of being descended from Thomas Jefferson, I kind of blocked it out. 
Um, he, he didn't seem that relevant to who I was as a kid growing up in Berkeley. I didn't really bother to connect him to my present life at Amherst College. And, but I also certainly had never really bothered to uh, stop and engage the institution of slavery. So it wasn't just that Sally Hemings' name got mentioned, it was like the first name of somebody who'd ever been enslaved by my family that I'd ever kind of heard said out loud. And when I began to think about what a tip of the iceberg that was for, um, I wanted to know more about this institution that had basically sustained my family since the arrival of William Randolph in 1670 until emancipation. Um, and, you know, the institution of racism as it went on being practiced in Virginia. Um, you know, and I, I became really, really fascinated with this. So when I applied to the American Antiquarian Society, I think I may have applied, did I? I think I applied the first time and I got rejected. I said I was going to write essays, and then the second time I said I was going to write poems. But the truth was I didn't know exactly what I was going to write. I just knew that I had this question that I needed to know more about my family and who they had been, um, especially in regards to the institutions of slavery that ended and that I just wanted some time to be allowed to think about that, and I, and I wanted to be able to write about it. So that's kind of how I came, came to be here, uh, you know, nearly 10 years ago. I'm gonna talk a lot tonight about the joy of working in the archive, but I wanted also to say that if in the end, the book that I've written has really been about the challenge of doing this work in archives. Some of you um, may have followed this recent story that came out in Vanity Fair where there was a, a character at 12 years a slave, the, the, the very dark woman character, I'm forgetting her name, but, but the Vanity Fair reporter went down to try to figure out if he, he could trace her actual physical life back to a historic document. And you know she spent a month or so at it and discovered that she couldn't. Um, this is a frustration that's really uh, common for people who do work where they're trying to actually find out specific narratives about slavery. Um, and so I'm just, the cover of this book ended up being about this kind of problem of the unevenness of the archive. We have um, a picture of a letter by Thomas Jefferson, and now the, the Monticello is engaged in a project of, of cataloging. Um, 17 volumes of his letters. It's a multi-decade process of, of every, all the letters he ever wrote. It's probably going to take you know 50 more years or something just to get those down. And then the other um, thing that you're seeing is the ledger, and that's actually Jefferson's farm journal. And you know Jefferson actually was a pretty immaculate record keeper in lots of ways. Um, we're, we're really able to see a lot about his daily life as a farmer and as a plantation owner, um, but this is kind of typical of a record that he would keep, and you can kind of look and see. The list goes lambs, bulls, um, 19 cows, and then it lists three-year-old males and females, two-year-old males and females. Of course, those refer to people, and we probably will never know which people they refer to, that we're not going to be allowed access to that information. Um, the Monticello has been very, very active in trying to do genealogy for African American families that were enslaved at Monticello. But you know, Jefferson owned over 600 slaves um, at one time, and I don't know exactly the total of, of all the you know, bodies that passed through his plantations. Um, we're, we're nowhere near close to figuring out who some of those people were. There's, a, there's a, a great number of named people, but there's an even greater number of unnamed people. So, this actually ties back to archival research because he, it was here at the American Antiquarian Society that I sort of began to encounter that imbalance when you're looking at records from 18, you know, that date to 1876, you're also at the mercy of looking at what people chose to write down. And there are things that they didn't write down. You know, people, uh, 
African Americans have great problems doing genealog genealogical work because, um, you know, until 18, the 1870 census, their names just simply don't appear or reliably in court documents of any kind. Well, I'm a writer, and I love documents, and I love writing, and I love these old books. I just adore them, and I love this institution and all that it stands for, but the absence that's within it I find incredibly haunting. And what sort of grew upon me as I grew in within me as I did this work was to begin to think about the violence of not writing people down and what that meant to me as a writer and somebody who's inherited so much writing and also so much that was written about my family um, that, you know, so much that's traceable within my own personal history, what it means to inherit also at the same time so much absence. I mentioned that I was thinking about writing essays. The fact is I was encountering a lot of shards and fragments, and that I also had just gotten an MFA in poetry. And a lot of times when I was doing the work with these archival materials, I ended up just deciding to make use of the shards themselves. And so uh, I kept thinking I'm going to be writing these essays eventually, but I was writing what was coming out were these poems that were more, um, more determined to use the kind of absence in the record than to try to work to correct it. So I think if I had persisted in sort of acting as a historian, for instance, or acting maybe as a journalist, I would have worked very hard to create a narrative that sort of filled in the spaces of silence. But because I was working as a poet, I ended up uh, finding a form where I could just make use of the absences that I was finding in the record. Because the absences themselves are so sort of profound. The experience of encountering this piece of paper where you see three-year-old males, females, it's kind of an intense, intense experience, and I, I, I just uh, ended up wanting to find a form where that absence could speak for itself. Just, just to give you a sense of the kind of documents I would be looking at. This isn't from here, and I looked really hard to see if I could find a document, a photograph of a document from here, and then I didn't, and then <laughs> it, it just, I didn't retrace these steps. But this is just an archaeology report. And what it is, is the, uh, the state of Virginia wanted to build a freeway. And in the process, they ended up crossing some land that had been owned by the Randolph family. And uh, the house that was sort of the historic home had been moved into Richmond. And so what was left here was um, they discovered that the freeway was going to cross over um, several burial grounds, unmarked burial grounds. And so the state requires that they dig those up, do an archaeological report of value, write up a report, and then recommend what to do next. And so uh, this report, so this, I mean, in just pretty dry language, it, 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 uh, it details the process of digging up these bodies, studying them for the clues of what you could learn about what people ate, how their, you know, how their bones revealed anything about their lives, and then um, putting them back into the ground and moving the freeway slightly to the right. In Virginia, it happens that if you um, are it happens that if you can prove relationship to somebody in a burial ground, you can work to preserve it. You can actually preserve it in Virginia. But if, if there's no way to mark who's there, then you can't preserve it. So this question of who's named and who's not named you know, goes on exerting some relevance because th this is a graveyard full of people whose names are not, um, can't be matched to their bones. So I wanna, I wanted to show this to you. I'll, I'm gonna sort of close it out and move into reading poetry in just a minute. But um, there was this kind of document that I was working with. Um, I went to lectures. Uh, I lived at Monticello for six weeks. 
but here also I just had the experience of looking at this kind of archival material, um, wills, I, I looked at a commonplace books, I looked at the kind of um, ephemera and material culture of my ancestors and people like them. Um, and, and then I wrote down what that was like um, in, a, in a kind of a different voice than this. So. So, the Forage House, and uh, it begins with two quotes. One is from the late, great Herman Melville, and it says, Yes, all these brave houses and flowery gardens came from the Atlantic, Pacific, and Indian oceans. One and all, they were harpooned and dragged up hither from the bottom of the sea. And the next quote comes from the late, great Polish poet, Zbigniew Herbert. And it says, ignorance about those who have disappeared undermines the reality of the world. Here are two poems about places where houses aren't. And I should say that also, as I was doing this work, I wanted the poems not only to be about history writ large, but also about the kind of oral histories that we carry with us from our families, that kind of blurry thing that you <coughs> buy at a family reunion after two gin and tonics. Oh, and then not all my ancestors are as grand as Thomas Jefferson. Big granny. When they found Emmeline, a nail held her sack dress together at the neck. She lived by gathering herbs for curing leather, lived off land her people held since they took it from the Cherokee, quilted mountainsides in Appalachia where they hewed walnut into rocking chairs and sang the stony country's blessings be and ballads carried in their ears from Scotland. From my grandmother, her granddaughter, I have one word in her dialect, Stein. Long ah, half rhyme with steam, its meaning not enough, as there's nary stein of tea nor sugar nor. In iron light, in the mountain graveyard, her clans set their stones grow up with moss thick as harmonies and shape note too. In those woods, a shadowy foundation. They took apart her house to save the boards. Two, 18th century remains. Albemarle County. The ridge a half mile down from Monticello, a pit cut deeper than the plow line. Archaeologists plot the dig by scanning plantation land map to field for carbon, ash, traces of human dwelling. We stand amid lone cypresses. Inheritors of absences, we peer into the five by five foot ledge. Unearthed painstakingly, these shards, two pipe stems, seeds, three green buttons. Centuries old hearthstones are still charred as if the fire is only lately gone. Did they collect these buttons to adorn? But no one knows. Did they trade, use them for barter? Silence again. Light each delicate pipe stem, something someone smoked at last against a sill log wall that did for home, a place where someone else collected wedges of cast off British willow wear. Between vines, a tenuous cocoon, a grassy berm that was a road, a swaying clue faint as relief at finding something left of lives held here that now vanish off like blue smoke blooms I suddenly imagine, which are not, will not, cannot be enough. I think as, um, basically as a literary person instead of a historian, I also think about the way that, you know, stories shape us. Um, 
So it occurred to me that going to look for family in this way was a little bit like the story of Tess of the Durbervilles. It didn't turn out very well for her. <laughs> she dies, I'm really hoping it's better for me. Official history. You work as a journalist, pursuing legends of other people. It is October, gold leaves fall on your birthday. Little mysteries swirl with you, a Tess, now hunting out a dented spoon or crest, some half disguised by which to know yourself. In Boston or Brooklyn, you carry some rune, afraid of a lover, dreading the war. Your friends barter carbon, prepare for pandemics. In airports, you watch tarmacs flicker through your reflection, leave versions of selves in the various cities, misplace your doppelgangers, little Americas, discarded paperbacks. O oh, slaveholder and O oh, bastard son, O oh, blurred stone and out of wedlock woman. This next poem is very much about archives. In fact, I think some of the images of the archive um, that show up in it come from here, from being here that summer. Um, and also the very first image is an image from a will um, of, a, of an ancestor of mine named Ethelred Taylor, who was one of the Taylors he, that married into the Randolph family. And um, that's how the Taylor name came in. He, he married it. Jefferson's uh, great-granddaughter, great-great-granddaughter. Anyway, the point is that here was the place where I dug up this will, and I, I, I read this will, the words of it, and I remember showing it to the librarian, and she was like, yeah, that's your poem. <clears throat> Southampton County Will, 1745. One, I, Ethelred Taylor, of sound mind and body, in the presence of God, almighty amen, do deed three things, books, negroes, land. Accumulations pass each to a son. I find his will, pen in hand, shift my books, hurt to see. From his dim ghost I inherit everything, Nothing, one silver teaspoon, half a name. Two, in another ink smear, crazed genealogy, Jefferson, indebted, sold his own books to form the first national library. He bought more, wrote, I cannot live without books, then died in a debt greater than the nation's. Three, in botany's wild turkey stalk islands, each painted bloom shimmering as all that lay west. I have seen continents strewn with theatrical objects, women's bodies open as plunder, even in the margins of the most accurate maps. Four, bestiaries, night blooming flowers, model arteries, anatomies, German philosophy, cabinetry, every Palladian vision. I was taught he could not afford to free his slaves. Most valuable for their number ever offered at one time in the state of Virginia, said the newspaper his granddaughter's husband published. For auction, furniture, family. Faded ink yellow as bruises now underscores his tall walls of high Rome. I can trace the names of his white children's descendants. Where the enslaved went after auction is partial, not all written down. Five, in any archive, fingering pages, I am enthralled by gilt work, silk, leather, the quill strokes turn, feel a physical want for ink as if desiring the conquest of tongues and feel my pen's weight. Who bartered for this parchment made with a knife? Whose life was traded? Luxury of blind and delicate pages. On which spines does this volume rest? I want to read 
read you the poems tonight that have to do with artifacts, um, because I feel like this is a place that's just in, that made me, um, gave me the privilege of being so close to these artifacts and letting them sort of speak to me. Um, so I thought I'd read you a poem, it's a, it's a sonnet actually, uh, that I wrote at Monticello when I was allowed to see Jefferson's Daughter's Commonplace book. And for those of you that don't know, a commonplace book is just your, kind of like your daily journal. I mean, it, it could have been lots of things. It could have been copying over poems that you liked. But oftentimes, it was just sort of a ledger of, of really to, mundane to-do list type things or organizing of your calendar. Now I'm totally paranoid that there's a real historian of commonplace books that's going to come and correct me, but I, that's my understanding of how commonplace books work. Kind of like that. So this is Jefferson, Martha Jefferson's housewife. And I was allowed to see it um, and see this thing, that this notes, notes that she'd kept to herself. Probably, you know, in about 1802. Martha Jefferson's housewife. A woman's list to-do and day tasks, red commonplace needle and thimble, light in the hand with ivory inlay, her tight-lipped cursive, scent for linen, for cornmeal, her eggs to the market, chicken feed and slave rations, repay money to Big George, Isaac Hemings, velvet, four yards, want laces, need muslin, and one page mid-list her record presents, with no explanation, a quotation from Shakespeare. My poverty but not my will consents. Museum of the Confederacy. Another historic home. Inside only time has attacked. The Confederacy's moths have gnawed its blue wolves into tatters delicate as widow's laces. In a reconstruction tent, Lee's tarnished bowls await no one's meal. To name is to claim, to abandon, to forget. Pastel dioramas display muskets at dawn. A caption explains how some blacks diligently followed their masters. To abandon is to forget. Outside, the state hospital looms, smelling like sour cafeteria pizza and sweat. The freeway overlays the once free black district. Smokers huddle in their designated spot. Above the rosewood table, Stewart's G. Washington, these lamps once sputtered with rose oil. Solemn, interpretable ghost in a second war for independence, to name is to claim. A once bell tested her diamond with the mirror. He does, he does not, insoluble, who knows? Beyond the Rococo women's withdrawing room, the now sick peer in at ghost heads of once state. The guide gives a lengthy explanation of the fashion for false services, velvet, fake paneling. Refers to the servants, quelle politesse. Jacob Mark's roller map opens namelessly west. Handsome dolls in a nursery, the Davis boy's toy musket. He's a wild one. He made bullets and then shot real people with it. So I'm going to end with two poems. One is long, and one is short. Um, this is a poem I actually began in residence at Monticello, um, and it took me maybe six years to get it right to my, to my sense. Um, it's the privilege of the poem, unlike, say, the historian or the journalist, to have this, this form of apostrophe, which is to address a thing or a person, um, preferably beyond one's hearing, 
I mean, that's the lyric space to reach out beyond the frame of the possible and to, you know, to address the dead, the life to come, um, busy old fool, unruly son. I, I grew up in Berkeley, uh, California, and um, it turns out that uh, Thomas Jefferson's grandfather was, great-grandfather was William Randolph, and he came in 1670. He got a land grant and was an incredibly ambitious person and got subsequent land grants for his children and basically uh, took the region west of the Chesapeake uh, and, and ran Virginia until the Civil War. Um, probably one of the largest slave-owning dynasties um, you know, during that period. To get that land grant, uh, Tom, uh, William Randolph had a mentor, and that mentor uh, gave his name to the town I grew up in. His name was Bishop George Berkeley. So this, this uh, poem begins with a quote, which says, Westward the course of empire makes its way. A letter to Jefferson from Monticello. One. I climbed through what remains of your oak forest and passed again our gated family graveyard, Granddaddy's Stone and Bennett Taylor's and Cornelia Jefferson's and all the Marthas, and up the leafy slope to Monticello and slunk into your study filled with pedestals, translations of the Bible, Livy, Herodotus, porcelain head of Voltaire's inkwell, plans for ornamental farm, Nouvelle Maison Carré, feeling that Rome might yet exist, Forum, Project of Appropriation, your America. Oh, hypocrite, you make me tired. Like Whitman, you contradict yourself. <coughs> Two, images, you, lofty, curious, child of a map maker, a new world aristocrat, in your one-room schoolhouse on the Randolph land grant, re learning Latin in a wilderness. Writing that in 16 generations, the aboriginal Native Americans would be like the Britons after Caesar and produce their own Cicero. Defending America's greatness from French snobbery with a moose. Nine generations later, very few of us read Cicero. Moose reclaim New England after heavy farming, and your house is a museum whose enormous gift shop sells your profile cast in crumbly chocolate, versions of your favorite peony, and umbrellas with your signature, $13.95 plus tax. Here's your garden, marrow peas, asparagus, nubbed beginnings of the scarlet runner bean. I still hear school children asking why you needed slaves to grow them. Oh, great rhetorician, tell me, what should I say? Three, I wait where your public stood in the balcony front hall, your wonder cabinet. Recreations of buffalo skin and beaded dress, relics of tribal peoples you courted Roman style with coins. As tourists shuffle off to the last buses, I hear other silence. Beyond this great hall and upstairs, the dome room, the wasp-filled cuddy, the cramped quarters of your grandchildren who inherited your debt. Four, families are still stories. Now we look for them with DNA. DNA would have fascinated you. It is symmetrical, almost rational, the way you thought America's rivers would be when you sent Lewis and Clark West to collect and cross the continent to gather birds and roots and pipes and pelts and herbs and a ram skull that still hangs here and dialects of tribal languages which they subsequently lost. We haven't found those dialects. We have found DNA, and tests of it suggest, though cannot fully prove, that you had two families, legitimate and illegitimate, two rivers proceeding out from you, remembered unevenly, like names that have been saved and those that have been lost. Your family made of structured absence. Some people in your white family this makes furious. Others simply wonder what a family is. The word, like freedom, shifts beneath us, recombinant, reforming. Our country argues now about it. We can't decide what it should mean. Five. Looking at the buffalo robe that is a shawnee map, I think about asymmetry. 
the ever-presence of the story we can't tell, won't see. All stories contain opposites. If you only look at DNA, you do not see the whole buffalo country self. Whatever frame you look through changes what you see. I admire your 17th century micrometer, your telescope. We saved your hand cast silver spectacles, but I don't know how to see you despite wanting to, also because of your fractured families. You disappear behind your multitude of portraits. Six. So much I think of what we love about America is hybrid, like a fiddle, like rock and roll, which holds African and English rhythms near meeting near a river that in the 1800s you called the Cherokee Tennessee. Beautiful and navigable, you said. Aesthetic, practical, a complex way of being, a difficult pose to hold. I wondered driving down here listening to true colors and the Christian station, how to feed body and soul. Cherries bloom at Shadwell, near the X grounds of Ligo, all the lost plantations where our many families lived. Seven. In this house museum, I get special permission to touch your bedspread, peer into your Virgil, hunt as if for clues. It all only looks still, but was always unfinished. You designed porches and dumbwaiters, elaborate passages like those beneath the Colosseum where the Roman slaves died in the Panes at Circenses. Your craft, keeping people hidden. I ask, must beauty do this? On what must beauty rest? Eight. Nine generations later, I live on a fault line. I hike through redwood sorrel, live oak, plants you'd love to name. Berkeley, where I grew up, is utopian too. Many people there build experimental gardens and devote their lives to cultivating the best kind of tomato. Because one has to try to make the world a better place. And Berkeley is segregated. Its promise is unhealed. Oh, and this is also inheritance from you. Nine. California's roadmap calls it geologically young and restless. It is literally in motion, and in 10 million years will be someplace else. Now it is coastlines, train tracks, mountains, underfunded universities, overcrowded prisons, factory farms, expensive cheese, pesticides and ocean, budget crises, artichokes. I learned Latin there. I recrossed the continent. I stand in your moat-filled sunlight in my solitary fancy. The doors close any moment. Mr. Jefferson, you've also left me this. I've never had to work in any field except for gardens that I planted. I roam with a lion's share of your uneven freedom. I pass as a dreamer collecting names. These are beautiful and come from many languages, reminding me how in Rome columns rear and overlap. Madrone, eucalyptus, manzanita, scars themselves unsolved or healing. O oh, architect of hopes and lies, brilliant, fascinating, ambitious, foundering father I revere and hate and see myself in. Thank you so much for coming to me. My grandmother is a great reader of poetry. I think that's probably why I felt that it was a respectable profession, which it's not really. And uh, when she passed away, she had a friend who was a Wordsworth scholar, um, a woman who hadn't practiced uh, that scholarship because she was just of the generation where she just gave up her scholarship when she got married. But she's a really good reader. And I gave her this book, and she said something so sweet to me. She said, Tess, when you were 22, you wrote a poem about cairns which are those piles of rocks that we all use as hikers, you know, to mark the path. Um, we have to find them first in order to know where the path is, and then we need to leave them in good repair so the people behind us can know where the path is. And she said, 
I think your book is just a book of cares. I, I love that. So anyway, this is a poem for that grandmother. And for New England, let's, let's end in New England. Route 1 North, Woolwich, Maine. Even this junk shop claims to be for sale. Even this junk shop comes apart. It splays at lopsided angles where the sills of two half farmhouses that formed it separate. The porch buckles, molding sag, the whole becomes components. For now, for sale, for who? No proper summer people will come paw. The maples are already turning red. Still, of each thing here, someone has thought. Don't throw it yet. Someone might want it. Someone might extract a value from the wreck. Some artist, maybe. In real life, who's got time to patch worn frames? For rescue, anyway. But if someone comes needing this rubble, bless him. Bless the lobster cart beside the Dairy Queen. Cracked enamel tubs, the sled, the screens, the oil-smeared curtain bellying in rain. The cockamamie fork up on a ledge. The forage house, its crazed assemblage. May someone find a window in this wind. If the bathtub holds water, let someone use it as a planter for geraniums. May anyone who likes to mend, come mend. Thank you.